you good people. It's your good sister, Morgan Renee Myers, tuning in with another story time with more of my... I have been gone, but I'm back. We are reading The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. I'm going to hop right into it. I ended off um, in the section that was entitled Winter. Uh, it's split up into two parts, so based on the copy that I have, it'll be... I'll be reading pages 81 through 94. See the cat, it goes meow, meow, come and play, come and play, come play with Jane. The kitten will not play, play, play. They come from Mobile, Aiken, from Newport News, from Marietta, from Meridian, and the sound of these places in their mouths make you think of love. When you ask them where they are from, they tilt their heads and say, Mobile, and you think you've been kissed. They say, Aiken, and you see a white butterfly glance off a fence with a torn wing. They say, Nagadolches, and you want to say, yes, I will. You don't know what these towns are like, but you love what happens to the air when they open their lips and let the names ease out. Meridian. The sound as it opens the windows of a room like the first four notes of a hymn. Few people can say the names of their hometowns with such sly affection. Perhaps because they don't have hometowns, just places they were born. But these girls soak up the juice of their hometowns and it never leaves them. They are thin brown girls who have looked long at hollyhocks holly hops in the backyards of Meridian, Mobile, Aiken, and Baton Rouge. And like hollyhocks, holly they are narrow, tall, and sealed. I don't know what a hollyhock is. Let's look that up. Already starting off of Tony Morrison. Hollyhocks. Okay, so it's a plant from what I'm seeing. Oh, okay, those are cute. Y'all should Google them because I'm not turning my phone around doing all this. I got two phones I'm recording on. This is too much. But it's basically like a, a beautiful pink flower. Very nice looking. Okay, so they are narrow and tall. They are. And still, their roots are deep. Their stalks are firm. Now, had I continued reading before looking it up, my context clues could have told me that this is likely a plant. Uh, their stalks are firm, and only the top blossom nods in the wind. They have the eyes of people who can tell what time it is by the color of the sky. Such girls live in quiet black neighborhoods where everybody is gainfully employed, where there are port swings hanging from chains, where the grass is cut with a scythe, where, I don't think I'm saying that right, let's see, where the grass is cut with an S-C-Y-P-H-E pronunciation, scythe. We are looking at how to pronounce this word in crops such as grass or corn. How do you go about pronouncing it? Scythe. Scythe. Oh, sorry. Why did I take out it? Scythe. Scythe. Okay. So, where the grass is cut with a scythe, where rooster combs and sunflowers grow in the yards and pots of bleeding heart, ivy, and mother-in-law tongue line the steps and window sills. Such girls have bought watermelon and snap beans from the fruit man's wagon. They have put in the window the cardboard sign that has a pound measure printed on each of three edges, 10 pounds, 25 pounds, 50 pounds, and no ice on the fourth. These particular brown girls from Mobile and Aiken are not like some of their sisters. They are not fretful nervous or shrill they do not have lovely black necks they stretch as though against an invisible collar their eyes do not bite these sugar brown mobile girls move through the streets without a stir they are as sweet and plain as butter cake slim ankles long narrow feet they wash themselves with orange colored life boy life boy soap dust themselves with cashmere bouquet tout clean their teeth with salt on a piece of rag, soften their skin with Jergens lotion. They smell like wood, newspapers, and vanilla. They, they straighten their hair with Dixie peach and part it on the side. At night, they curl it in a paper from brown bags, tie a print scarf around their heads, and sleep with hands folded across their stomachs. They do not drink, smoke, or swear, and they still call sex nookie. They sing second soprano in the choir, and although their voices are clear and steady, they are never picked to solo. They are in the second row, white blouses, starch, blue skirts, almost purple from ironing. They go to land-grant colleges, normal schools, and learn how to do the white man's work with refinement, home economics to prepare his food, teacher education to instruct black children in obedience music to soothe the weary um, 
master and entertain his blunted soul. Here they learned the rest of the lesson begun in those soft houses with porch swings and pots of bleeding heart how to behave. The careful development of thrift, patience, high morals, and good manners. In short, how to get rid of the funkiness. The dreadful funkiness of passion, the funkiness of nature, the funkiness of the wide range of human emotions. Wherever it erupts, this funk, they wipe it away. Where it crusts, they dissolve it. Wherever it drips, flowers, or clings, they find it and fight it until it dies. They fight this battle all the way to the grave. The laugh that is a little too loud, the enunciation that is a little too proud. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I didn't got it ahead of myself. Anyway, they say the laugh that is a little too loud, the enunciation a little too round, the gesture a little too generous. They hold their behind in for fear of a sway too free. When they wear lipstick, they never cover the entire mouth for fear the lips too thick, and they worry, worry, worry about the edges of their hair. They never seem to have boyfriends, but they always marry. Certain men watch them without seeming to, and know that if such a girl is in the house. He will sleep on sheets boiled white, hung out to dry on juniper bushes, and pressed flat with a heavy iron. There will be pretty paper flowers decorating the picture of his mother, a large Bible in the front room. They feel secure. They know their work clothes will be mended, washed, and ironed on Monday, that their Sunday shirts will billow on hangers from the door jam, stiffly starched and white. They look at her hands and know what she will do with biscuit dough. They smell the coffee and the fried ham, see the white smoky grit with a dollop of butter on top. Her hips assure them that she will bear children easily and painlessly, and they are right. What they do not know is that this plain brown girl will build her nest stick by stick, make it her very own inviolable world, and stand guard over its every plant, weed, and doily, even against him. In silence, she will return the lamp to where she put it in the first place. Remove the dishes from the table as soon as the last bite is taken. Wipe the doorknob after a greasy hand has touched it. A sidelong look will be enough to tell him the smoke on the back porch. Children will sense instantly that they cannot come into her yard to retrieve a ball. But the men do not know these things, nor do they know that she will give him her body sparingly and partially. He must enter her superstitiously, so repetitiously, I think. Is that a say? <laughs> Let's look it up. So repetitiously. S U R R E P. <clears throat> Here we go. In the way that attempts to avoid notice or attention secretively. Surreptitiously. Surreptitiously. Okay, surreptitiously. He must enter her surreptitiously or secretly, lifting the hem of her nightgown only to her navel. He must rest his weight on his elbows when they make love, ostensibly. To avoid hurting her breast, but actually to keep her from having to touch or feel too much of him. Well, baby, don't be a part of nobody else on the such a feel now. Uh, let's see. Ostensibly. Oh. Where am I at, Lord? Okay. Ostensibly. Ostensibly. Apparently or purportedly, but perhaps not actually. What kind of definition? <laughs> to all outward appearances, seemingly. Okay, ostensibly. Ostensibly. Okay. So he must, um, he must enter her surreptitiously, secretively, lifting the hem of her nightgown only to her navel. He must rest his weight on his elbows when they make love, ostensibly or seemingly. To avoid hurting her breast, but actually to keep her from having to touch or feel too much of him. While he moves inside her, she will wonder why they didn't put the necessary but private parts of the body in some more convenient place, like the armpit, for example, <laughs> or the palm of the hand, some place one could, ease, could get to easily and quickly without undressing. She stiffens when she feels one of her paper curlers coming undone from the activity of love imprints in her mind which one it is that is coming loose so she can quickly secure it once he is through. She hopes he will not sweat. The damp may get into her hair and that she will remain dry between her legs. She hates the glucking sound they make when she is moist. Baby, that's nature. When she senses some spasm about to grip him, she will make rapid movements with her hips, press her fingernails into his back, suck in her breath and pretend she is having an orgasm. 
She might wonder again for the 600th time. Y'all reading this in school? Learning about orgasm? I guess. Sex is a beautiful thing, but it also deserves caution and wisdom and knowing yourself and giving of yourself to people that you truly love, respect, and that love and respect you. It is not to be abused or taken lightly, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, she's going to suck on her breath and pretend she is having an orgasm. She might wonder again for the 600th time what it would be like to have that feeling while her husband's penis is inside her. The closest thing to it was the time she was walking down the street and her napkin slipped free of her sanitary belt and moved gently between her legs as she walked, gently, ever so gently, and then a slight and distinctly delicious sensation collected in her crotch. As the delight grew, she had to stop in the street, hold her thighs together to contain it. That must be what it is like, she thinks, but it never happens while he is inside her. When he withdraws, she pulls her nightgown down, slips out of the bed, and into the bathroom with relief. Now, this is a sexual experience people go through where they are not enjoying it. They're just doing it for the person that they with or that they love. Um, but that comes with getting to know your partner, knowing their body, taking time um, to explore one another. So, again, not an activity you want to take lightly. You'll just be doing willy-nilly because you have hormones and have reached puberty. Definitely something to be mindful of, to take your time, to educate yourself on, to educate um, about the person that you're with. I can't believe y'all reading this in school. <laughs> okay. Um, occasionally, some living, some living thing will engage her affections, a cat perhaps, who will love her order, precision, and constancy, who will be as clean and quiet as she is. The cat will settle quietly on the windowsill and caress her with his eyes. So she want to be single with a cat? All right, sis. She can hold him in her arms, letting his paw, letting his back paw struggle for footing on her breast, and his forepaws cling to her shoulder. She can rub the smooth fur and feel the unresisting flesh underneath. At her gentlest touch, she will preen, stretch, and open his mouth, and she will accept the strangely pleasant sensation that comes when he writes beneath her hand and flattens his eyes with a, sh a sh mm. with a surfeit of sensual delight. Let's look that up. Sure, I don't even know. <laughs> surfeit. S-U-R-F-E-I-T Cause someone to desire no more of something as a result of having consumed or done it in excess. Surf it. Surf it. Okay. So what was we talking about? Um, and she will accept the strangely pleasant sensation that comes when he writes beneath her hand and flattens his eyes with a surfeit of sensual delight. Okay. <sighs> When she stands cooking at the table, he will circle about her shanks, and the thrill of his fur spirals up her legs to her thighs to make her fingers tremble a little in the pie dough. Or as she sits reading the uplifting thoughts in the Liberty magazine, the cat will jump into her lap. She will fondle that soft heel of hair and let the warmth of the animal's body seep over and into the deeply private areas of her lap. This is getting weird. She got, it sounds like she's more into the cat that she don't even possess right now than the man that she has. Sometimes the magazine drops and she opens her leg just a little and the two of them will be still together, perhaps shifting a little together, sleeping a little together until 4 o'clock when the intruder comes home from work, vaguely anxious about what's for dinner. Dang! They made the man a whole intruder and gave the cat all the props. Lord have mercy. The cat will always know that he is first in her affections, even after she bears a child, for she does bear a child easily and painlessly, but only one, a son, named Junior. One such girl from Mobile or Mer Meridian or Aiken who did not sweat in her armpits nor between her thighs, who smelled of wood and vanilla, who made souffles in the home economic department, moved with her husband, Louis, to Lorraine, Ohio. Her name was Geraldine. There she built her nest, iron shirts, potted bleeding hearts, played with her cat, and birthed Louis Jr. Geraldine did not allow her baby Jr. to cry. As long as his needs were physical, she could meet them, comfort and safety. He was always brushed, bathed, oiled, and shod. Geraldine did not talk to him, coo to him, or indulge him in kissing bouts, but she saw that every other desire was fulfilled. It was not long before the child discovered the difference in his mother's behavior to himself and the cat. As he grew older, he learned how to direct his hatred of his mother to the cat and spent some happy moments watching his supper. 
The cat survived because Geraldine was seldom away from home and could effectively soothe the animal when Junior abused him. Geraldine, Lewis, Junior, and the cat lived next to the playground of Washington Irving School. Junior considered the playground his own, and the school children coveted his freedom to sleep late, go home for lunch, and dominate the playground after school. He hated to see the swings, slides, monkey bars, and seesaws empty and tried to get kids to stick around as long as possible. White kids. His mother did not like him to play with niggers. She had explained to him the difference between colored people and niggers. They were easily identifiable. Colored people were neat and quiet. Niggers were dirty and loud. He belonged to the former group. He wore white shirts and blue trousers. His hair was cut as close to his scalp as possible to avoid any suggestion of wool. The part was etched into his hair by the barber. In winter, his mother put Jergen's lotion on his face to keep the skin from becoming ashen. Even though he was light-skinned, it was possible to ash. The line beneath colored and nigger was not always clear. Subtle and telltale signs threatened to erode it, and the watch had to be constant. Junior used to long to play with the black boys. More than anything in the world, he wanted to play king of the mountain and have them and have them push him down the mound of dirt and roll over him. He wanted to feel their hardness pressing over him, smell their wild blackness, and say, fuck you, with that lovely casualness. He wanted to sit with them on curve stones and compare the sharpness of jackknives, the distance of arcs of foot of sitting, and the toilet he wanted to share with them, the laurels of being able to pee far and long. Bayboy and P.L. had at one time been his idols. Gradually, he came to agree with his mother that neither Bayboy nor P.L. was good enough for him. He played only with Ralph Ninsky, who was two years younger, wore glasses, and didn't want to do anything. More and more, Junior enjoyed bullying girls. It was easy making them scream and run. How he laughed when they fell down and their bloomer showed. When they got up, their faces red and crinkled. It made him feel good. The nigger girls he did not pick on very much. They usually traveled in packs. And once, when he threw a stone at some of them, they chased, caught, and beat him with it. He lied to his mother saying Bay Boy did it. His mother was very upset. His father just kept on reading the Lorraine Journal. When the mood struck him, he would call a child passing by to come play on the swings or the seesaw. If the child wouldn't or did and left too soon, Junior threw gravel at him. He became a very good shot. Alternately bored and frightened at home, the playground was his joy. On a day when he had been physically especially idle, he saw a very black girl taking a shortcut through the playground. She kept her head down and she walked. He had seen her many times before, standing alone, always alone, at recess. Nobody ever played with her. Probably, he thought, because she was ugly. Now Junior called to her. Hey, what are you doing walking through my yard? The girl stopped. Nobody can come through this yard unless I say so. This ain't your yard. It's the school. But I'm in charge of it. The girl started to walk away. Wait, Junior walked toward her. You can play it if you want to. What's your name? Pecola. I don't want to play. Come on, I'm not going to bother you. I got to go home. Say, you want to see something? I got something to show you. No. What is it? Come on in my house. See, I live right there. Come on, I'll show you. Show me what? Some kittens. We got some kittens. You can have one if you want. Real kittens? Yeah, come on. Uh-oh, why do I feel like this is about to go well? He pulled gently at her dress. Pacola began to move toward his house. When he knew she had agreed, Junior ran excitedly, stopping only to yell back at her to come on. He held the door open for her, smiling his encouragement. Pacola climbed the porch stairs and hesitated there, afraid to follow him. The house looked dark. Junior said, there's nobody here. My mind's gone out and my father's at work. Don't you want to see the kitten? Junior turned on the light. Pacola stepped inside the door. How beautiful, she thought. What a beautiful house. There was a big red and gold Bible on the dining room table. Little lace doilies were everywhere on arms and backs of chairs in the center of a large dining table on little tables. Potted plants were on the window sills. A color picture of Jesus Christ hung on a wall with the prettiest paper flowers fastened on the frame. She wanted to see everything slowly, slowly, but Junior kept saying, Hey, you, come on, come on. He pulled her into another room even more beautiful than the first. More doilies, a big lamp with a green and gold base and white shade. There was even a rug on the floor with enormous dark red flowers. She was deep in admiration in the flowers of the flowers when Junior said, Here, Pacola turned. Here's your kitten. He Wait a minute, wait a minute. She was in deep admiration of the flowers when Junior said, Here, Pacola turned. Here's your kitten, he screeched, and he threw a big black cat right in her face. She sucked in her breath in fear and surprise and felt fur in her mouth. The cat clawed her face and chest in an effort to right itself, then leaped nimbly to the floor. 
Junior was laughing and running around the room, clutching his stomach delightedly. Pocola touched the scratch place on her face and felt tears coming. When she started toward the doorway, Junior leaped in front of her. You can't get out. You're my prisoner, he said. His eyes were merry but hard. You let me go. No. He pushed her down, ran out the door that separated the rooms, and held it shut with his hands. Pocola's banging on the door increased his gasping, high-pitched laughter. The tears came fast as she held her face in her hands when something soft and furry moved around her ankles. She jumped and saw it was a cat. He wound himself in and about her legs. Momentarily distracted from her fear, she squatted down to touch him, her hands wet from the tears. The cat rubbed up against her knee. He was black all over, deep silky black, and his eyes, pointing down toward his nose, were bluish green. The light made them shine like blue ice. Pacolo rubbed the cat's head. He whined, his tongue flicking with pleasure. The blue eyes and the black face held her. Junior, curious and not hearing her sobs, opened the door and saw her squatting down, rubbing the cat's back. He saw the cat stretching its head and flattening its eyes. He had seen that expression many times as the animal responded to his mother's touch. Give me my cat, his voice broke. With the movement both awkward and sure, he snatched the cat by one of his hind legs and began to swing it around his head in a circle. Stop that, Pocola was screaming. The cat's free paws were stiffened, ready to grab anything to restore balance. Its mouth wide, its eyes blue streaked, its eyes blue streaked to Pora. Still screaming, Pocola reached for Junior's hand. She heard her dress rip under her arm. Junior tried to push her away, but she grabbed the arm which was swinging the cat. They both fell, and in falling, Junior let go of the cat, which, having been released in mid-motion, was thrown full force against the window. It slithered down and fell on the radiator, uh uh-oh, behind the sofa. Except for a few shutters, it was still. There was only the slightest smell of singed fur. Geraldine opened the door. What is this? Her voice was mild, as though asking a perfectly reasonable question. Who is this girl? She killed our cat, said Junior. Look, he pointed to the radiator where the cat lay, its blue eyes closed, leaving only an empty, black, and helpless face. Geraldine went to the radiator and picked up the cat. He was limp in her arms, but she rubbed her face in his fur. She looked at Pacola, saw the dirty torn dress, the plait sticking out her head, hair matted where the plaits had come undone, the muddy shoes with the wet wad of gum peeping out from beneath between the cheap soles, the soiled socks, one of which had been walked down into the heel of the shoe. She saw the safety pin holding the hem of the dress. Up over the hump of the cat's back, she looked at her. She had seen this little girl all of her life hanging out of windows over saloons and mobile, crawling over the porches of shotgun houses on the edge of town, sitting in bus stations, holding paper bags, and crying to mothers who kept saying, Shut up! Hair uncombed, excuse me, dresses falling apart, shoes untied, and caked with dirt. They had stared at her with great uncomprehending eyes, eyes that questioned nothing and asked everything, unblinking and unabashed. They stared up at her, the end of the world lay in their eyes in the beginning, and all the ways in between. They were everywhere. They slept six in a bed, all their pee mixing together in the night as they wet their beds, each in his own candy and potato chip dreams. In the long, hot days, they idled away, picking plaster from the walls and digging into the earth with sticks. They sat in little rows on street curbs, crowded into pews at church, taking space from the nice, neat, colored children. They clowned on the playground, broke things in dime stores, ran in front of you on the street, made ice slides on the slope sidewalks in winter. The girls grew up knowing nothing of girls, and the boys announced their manhood by turning the bills of their cats backward. Grass wouldn't grow where they lived. The flowers died. Shades fell down. Tin cans and tires blossomed where they lived. They lived on cold black-eyed peas and orange pops. Like flies, they hovered. Like flies, they settled. And this one settled in her house. Up over the hump of the cat's back, she looked. Get out, she said, her voice quiet. You nasty little black bitch. Get out of my house. The cat shuddered and flicked his tail. Pacola backed out of the room, staring at the pretty milk brown lady in the pretty golden green house who was talking to her through the cat's fur. The pretty lady's words made the cat's fur move. The breath of each word parted the fur. Pacola turned to find the front door and saw Jesus looking down at her with sad and unsurprised eyes. His long brown hair parted in the middle. The gay paper flowers twisted around his face. Outside, the March wind blew into the rip in her dress. She held her head down against the cold. She could not hold it low enough to avoid seeing the snowflakes falling and dying on the pavement. Oh, Lord, what a sad life. All right, that's the end of that. Um, the next section will be spring. I'll start at page 95. Thank y'all for tuning in, and I hope y'all have a good rest of y'all day. Peace.